So we have a continuous dripping of that stress hormone into the body. It's just dripping all the time, getting us ready to run or fight or flight at any moment at the drop of a hat. We're ready to go because we're on guard. Well, the problem is, what does that mean about your allocation of energy? And it says, we're spending most of our energy in protection. You cannot survive if you're in protection all the time. And if the parasite can control the nature of the fear, it can then create a fear among us that only it can defend us against. A recent physical manifestation of this comes from Zbigniew Brzezinski, former Secretary of State who also supported President Barack Obama. In his book, The Grand Chessboard, he states, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus of foreign policy issues except in the circumstance of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. Even the Reich Fuhrer of the Nazi party, Hermann Goering, sums up this game of supply and demand perfectly when he stated the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. It also works the same in every individual psyche. Just remember that the false ego has only one desire, to become greater and more powerful than the true self. This illness causes us to believe that we are separate from nature. This is why we see such a rise in the dependency of technology. This is why we see such little stewardship for the earth and the environment. And this is why we see bigotry, racism, sexism, and every other form of discrimination possible that leads to crime, violence, wars, and eventually, the global destruction of the organism. This endless state of fear, confusion, and segregation our world seems to live in is a symptom of the false ego creating a false threat. many of the United States presidents have blood relations with each other. The Bush lineage has blood ties to a great number of former presidents. George Washington, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, Grover Cleveland, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and Gerald Ford. Michael Tassarian points out in his work that Bush is closely related to every European monarch on and off the throne, and has kinship with every member of Britain's royal family. Bush's family tree can be documented as far back as the early 15th century. He has a direct descent from Henry III and from Henry VIII's sister Mary Tudor. He is also descended from Charles II of England. And we also find that George W. Bush is a direct descendant of Godfrey de Bullion. Godfrey was the first king of Jerusalem after he recaptured it from the Saracens, which was the name for the Islamic faith during the Middle Ages. It is interesting to note that the current occupation of the United States in the Middle East was re-established by the same family, George Bush Sr. in 1991 and again by George Bush Jr. in 2003. George Bush Jr. is then found to be a cousin to both opposing candidates of his two terms in office, Al Gore and John Kerry. Democratic President Barack Obama also has blood ties with George W. Bush, as well as Gerald Ford, Lyndon Johnson, Harry Truman, James Madison, and the British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill. On the opposing side of the 2008 presidential ballot, John McCain is descended from Robert the Bruce, King William I of Scotland, and also Godfrey de Bullion. One probably one of the most interesting facets of the bloodline relations is the fact that the whole British royal family has descent from the Muslim prophet Muhammad through the Arab kings of Seville. This bloodline was passed through the kings of Portugal, Castile, 
and eventually down to King Edward IV. And this is a very, very different story from what yeah, you hear the media pumping out every day, being this idea of lineal superiority. It's completely debunked, according to the foremost authority of aristocratic lineage, Burke's Peerage. And this just goes to show that there's the true story, and then there's the manufactured illusion, the front that's given to the public. These blood ties go on and on, and are documented thoroughly through literature such as Burke's Peerage and other comparable books. The point of all of this is that we find not just the same people, but the same intent within the people who have held high positions of monarchy, dynasty, aristocracy and democracy, in the past and present, and they are all related by a physical and symbolic link. This bloodline carries the symbol of our illness. The symptoms of our psycho-spiritual illness are the wars, terrorist attacks, artificial or man-made disasters and leader figures. As long as the people remain oblivious to their inner drives and inner nature, they will always fail to recognize why these events take place and why these figures rise to such powerful positions. The reason why we have failed for thousands of years to conquer these archetypal rulers permanently is because for thousands of years we have been fighting the symptoms of an illness and not the root cause. For every corrupt government that falls at the hands of a revolutionary oppressed people, two more will rise in its place every time. Because the root cause of a corrupt government does not exist in the individual leading that government. It exists within the psyche of every individual. Because an unaware host to a deadly parasite will do anything to avoid accepting his own incapacity for freedom. We are so bereft of sanity in this world that those few who simply stop projecting onto others and begin facing their own demons are seen as neurotic. An article written in the 1950s states that studies showed that individuals who had been isolated from their familiar social and cultural environment became neurotic. This shows that when those individuals had no object to identify their darker emotions with, they began to see these things in themselves that which they refused to recognize before and were unaware of why they appeared and how to cope. Facing our true inner self is virtually unknown in our world today. This is why no matter how many civilizations rise and fall, it is our collective consciousness that creates our governing apparatus, not individual people. and after countless attempts you would imagine that people would realize that a physical retaliation may not be the solution. Yet here we are, thousands of years later with technology that can clone DNA, vehicles that can break the sound barrier and probe the depths of space, and science that can overcome almost any sickness. Yet we still fail to take notice to the importance of thoughts and consciousness. This is the very definition of insanity and every single one of us is responsible for this psychic epidemic because we're killing the messenger and paying no attention to the message. During the 1990s, 
three Nobel laureates in medicine, advanced research that revealed the primary function of DNA lies not in protein synthesis as widely believed for the past century, but in electromagnetic energy reception and transmission. Less than 3% of DNA's function involves protein manufacture. More than 90% functions in the realm of bioacoustic and bioelectric signaling. So why is it important to know that DNA functions in bioelectric signaling? 